Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it's wonderful to see you all in person and on this very special occasion. It is first my great honor to introduce the Sladopolsky Lectureship for you today. And Dr. Sladopolsky is here with us. Ed, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, Dr. Sladopolsky embodies the true triple threat with his remarkable contributions in patient care, teaching, and scientific investigation. He has trained generations of academic nephrologists and scientists that carry on his legacy today in their own research laboratories. With his groundbreaking work in the areas of parathyroid hormone, vitamin D biology, chronic kidney disease, and metabolic bone disease, Dr. Sladopolsky's discoveries have improved the lives of our patients who suffer from kidney disease. In this renal division photo from 1981, we can see Dr. Sladopolsky in the front row next to Salo Klar and Mabel Perkerson. It's hard to believe, but Dr. Sladopolsky had already been on the faculty for more than 15 years by this time. This is um, Dr. Sladopolsky's famous rooster named Macho. This was a mean bird, but he produced the most potent and specific antibodies against parathyroid hormone the world had ever seen and enabled countless laboratories to measure PTH for the first time. In fact, we still have macho in the division today, not joking. <laughs> it's not an exaggeration to say that we in nef nephrology do view Eduardo as Superman, but also appreciate his wonderful sense of humor and panache. <laughs> We are all humbled and grateful at Ed's remarkable generosity to the division and school as well. Last year, he established the Eduardo and Judith Sladopolsky Professor of Medicine uh, uh, in Nephrology. And in October, we were finally able to celebrate Dr. Jeff Miner, who's also here today as the inaugural incumbent. Here is a picture of Jeff and his partner, Larry, and Jeff's family. Dr. Sladopolsky, it is a distinct honor to have you here today and thank you for your myriad contributions over the past 55 years. It is an equal pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Hoover who received his Bachelor of Arts degree in chemistry from Howard University, his medical degree from UCLA. He was an intern and resident in internal medicine at Emory University and a fellow in nephrology at Brigham and Women's. He served on the faculty at um, uh, Vanderbilt, Yale, and University of Chicago. He is currently the Dr. A. Rudolph and Ruth Ryder Huberwald Chair in Medicine and tenured professor of Medicine and Physiology at Emory, where he is also Chief of Nephrology. Tulane, oh dude, <laughs> Tulane. Yes, sorry, typo, oh, I'm gonna redo that. <laughs> Professor of Medicine and Physi Physiology at Tulane, where he's also Chief of Nephrology in the Department of Medicine. His research focuses on regulation of the thiazide sensitive sodium chloride co-transporter, which is the major effector of salt handling in the distal convoluted tubule. Dr. Hoover has served on many NIH study sections and under the national roles. And most recently, he and I served together on the ASN Workforce and Training Committee, where we actually recommended to make renal biopsy and line placement training as an opportunity to train rather than mandatory. He has received many honors and awards that are too numerous to list, but I do wanna highlight that he is recognized nationally in nephrology as an outstanding mentor and role model. Many of his mentees have gone into their own independent careers, and he was recognized earlier this year with the Clifford Barger Underrepresented Minority Mentorship Award by the American Physiological Society. It is thus appropriate that he deliver this grand rounds on the same day that we honor our own Will Ross, himself a renowned mentor and role model for so many. Dr. Fraser will have some remarks about Dr. Ross after the talk. Dr. Hoover's talk is entitled Stories Along the Path, A Tangential Scientific and Career Journey Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hoover. All right. So uh, it's my great honor to give this uh, talk uh, and uh, for, for two reasons, and the two reasons are, are sitting right here in front of me. And, and that is, uh, to give the Ed Eduardo Sladopolsky lecture, which is also the unveiling of the Will Ross portrait uh, here uh, and the two uh, giants uh, that uh, we are honoring today, I think uh, 
I, I, I have kind of molded my talk towards this. And so this is gonna be a little less of a scientific talk and a little bit more of a mentoring talk. Uh, and that is really an honor of these two gentlemen who have been amazing mentors to so many throughout their careers. And so it's gonna be geared towards residents, fellows, uh, uh, medical students and, and young faculty uh, about how that career path can happen and, and, uh, and also about perseverance through these uh, career paths that oftentimes are not linear paths that we imagine them to be. And so I, I really want um, the young people here and, and the older people too, to keep the big picture in mind, right? The big picture. Uh, and uh, this is a, a fable about the three stone cutters. So a man came across three stone cutters and asked them what they were doing. The first replied, I am making a living. The second kept on hammering while he said, I am doing the best job of stone cutting in the entire country. The third looked up with a visionary gleam in his eye and said, I am building a cathedral. And the one who's building the cathedral has that um, big long-term vision in mind. Uh, and I want uh, you all to, to consider your career as that cathedral and keep the big picture in mind as you go through the process. Um, and in medicine, very rarely are we in the category of just, I'm making a living. We have a calling. We do our thing, but oftentimes we do get into doing the best job of stone cutting, doing the best job of doing that one little thing or that one big thing that you do and doing that on a daily basis and excelling at that and keeping that, being focused on that, that little thing that you're the best at. But I would encourage you to, to keep the big picture in mind, uh, consider your career to be a cathedral uh, and, and, and act accordingly. So keep the big picture in mind. And just as a, uh, a, a lesson as to how I, uh, my pathway um, uh, evolved over time, I wanna start with what my simplistic undergrad brain conceived pathway was. Uh, I said, you know what? I wanna do an MD PhD. Why? Because what's more high power than having an MD and a PhD? Right? This is, this is the best thing you can be, right? And so then I said, you know, what I want to do is I want to do a neurosurgery residency. And why? Because that's what smart people do, right? Uh, they said brain surgery, right? That's what smart people do, rocket science, brain surgery. So that, I want to do brain surgery, yes. And then I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to become a neurosurgeon, and, and that's going to be the career. So this really simplistic, straightforward pathway uh, and then I got to med school and I said, you know what, I, I'm not going to do that PhD first. I'm going to do the MD. Got a pretty good scholarship from UCLA. So I was like, okay, I, I can go ahead and do my MD. And then I'll come back and, and do my, my uh, research in, in my later years. And, uh, and so at that point, I said, I'm going to do an MD. And then I'm going to do internal medicine. Realized that, that neurosurgery definitely wasn't for me. Did kidney physiology in med school and said, this is amazing, this is wonderful, this is what I wanna do. Uh, and, and so I'm gonna do internal medicine, then I'm gonna do a nephrology fellowship, uh, then I am going to uh, move on to faculty. Easy as that, right? So uh, became a little bit more, um, as time progressed, a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more understanding of what this pathway entails. And so now MD, internal medicine. And now I realize I'm gonna to need to do a nephrology fellowship with the research focus. I need to find a T32, uh, uh, um, a fellowship that has T32 training available uh, because I am going, since I didn't do a PhD, I'm going to need that really good basic science training. So I'm gonna do that. Then I'm gonna get a mentor grant, get that KO8. Then I'm gonna get that R01. Then I'm gonna get multiple R01s, full professor, maybe section chief, and it's gonna be boom, 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 boom. Now, in, in my mind, I, I, later on, I, I thought about this pathway and I said, you know, that, that's the Bill Humphreys pathway. <laughs> now, I, I, I may be wrong, maybe he's gonna tell me later on when I meet with him that I'm, that I'm wrong, but I always conceive that his, 
his path was uh, a straight line. Uh, and and uh, what you'll see is that uh, my, and, and, and most people's I think path is not a straight pathway. And so how did it actually happen? So MD at UCLA, then I went to uh, Antonio Madison at Emory. Emory was a very nephrocentric program there with the UI Coco as my chair and Bill Mitch as my chief. So I was gonna go there. And then I wound up uh, going and saying, hey, I'm gonna do this nephrology fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and so that is going to lead me to this straightforward path and I'm gonna go all down that path. So uh, the first thing that happened was I started my nephrology fellowship at Brigham and Women's. I did about a year and a half of research and my mentor came to me and said, hey, Robert, uh, I'm leaving. I am uh, going to Vanderbilt, where I'm going to be chief of nephrology. Do you want to come with me? Or are you going to stay at, at Harvard and, and, and find another mentor? Uh, and so I had a decision to make. And it's like, well, maybe this isn't going to go quite the way that I thought it was. And uh, this is Steve Hebert, this is my mentor. This is the reason why I actually went to Vanderbilt. And, and the reason why I, I wanna bring him up today is another theme of today's talk is uh, one thing you should do as a young person is pursue your passion. Find your passion and pursue your passion. So I was a chemistry major in undergraduate school. Um, I liked uh, uh, ion flux, I liked general chemistry sodium, potassium, chloride, those kinds of things. When I got to med school, I realized that's nephrology. Nephrology is what regulates all that stuff in our body, what keeps all those electrolytes at the right level. Uh, then uh, I went to, to uh, Emory University where I had a chronic uh, uh, outpatient internal medicine clinic uh, at Grady Hospital, one of the biggest county hospitals in the country. And there at Grady Hospital, I found out that hypertension is an epidemic, particularly among African-American patients, particularly in the South. And in my Grady Medical Clinic, every single, literally, every single one of my patients had hypertension. And some of them had uh, you know, cancer, some of them had coronary artery disease, but every one of them had hypertension. This wasn't really the case of UCLA in California in, in, uh, at this period of time. And so I was, I was really kind of surprised to find that it, it, hypertension was a true epidemic in this, in this, in this area. And, and so when I went and I met Steve Hebert at Brigham and Women's at Harvard, and he told me that he had just cloned the sodium chloride co-transporter, the site of action of the most commonly prescribed antihypertensive in the world, which also deals with the flux of ions I said, this could not be more perfect. This is what I am passionate about. I am going to work on this. And therefore I'm going to leave Harvard. I'm not gonna do my clinical year at Harvard. I'm gonna to move to Vanderbilt with Steve Hebert so I can continue to pursue my passion. Did my clinical year there. Some of my, my Brigham and Women uh, 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 co-fellows tease me because they're like, you're not really a Brigham fellow. You did, you did your, medical, you did your uh, clinical year at Vanderbilt. But uh, uh, it, this is called pursuing your passion. That's one of the big keys. So a little bit about some science. So uh, we talked about, uh, let's see here. We talked about uh, the uh, sodium chloride co-transporter. So this is a little picture of a little nephron with your glomerulus and your proximal tubule, et cetera. Well, here you have your distal convoluted tubule part of the nephron. Uh, and in this segment is where you have the sodium chloride co-transporter. And this is where thiazide diuretics actually work. Um, and uh, if you can imagine, this is the pro-urine, this is the lumen of the kidney tubule. Uh, in the distal convoluted tubule, the sodium and chloride and water is flowing down here and attaches to the sodium chloride co-transporter, which extends into the lumen. And, uh, and this uh, sodium and chloride is then reabsorbed uh, into the cell, into the interstitium, and then finally back into the bloodstream. Uh, increases in uh, function of this co-transporter, there's a genetic disease called familial hyperkalemia and hypertension, leads to hypertension. So increased activity of the co-transporter leads to hypertension, decreased activity of the co-transporter 
uh, leads to hypotension. Uh, and there's a genetic syndrome. And of course, we administer thiazide diuretics for that specific reason to decrease blood pressure. Um, in this part of the, uh, the, the now on the second part of the distal convoluted tubule, the epithelial sodium channel, uh, which is amyloride sensitive, is also in place. And I, I mentioned this because uh, that will become uh, part of uh, some research I show a little later on. So this is uh, the, uh, the cell and area that I've spent a lot of my my career studying. So, uh, so back to this uh, pathway. So I said, yeah, hey, Vanderbilt, okay, I'm gonna do it. Then we're gonna go here. And uh, it turns out that uh, there was another grant that was actually, for me at least, even better than a KOA. And that was the Amos Medical Faculty Development Program grant. Uh, Dr. Morrison was, was on that uh, selection committee back in, back in those days. And, uh, and, and he was part of, he was one of the mentors of that really important program. This is a, uh, also a mentored grant uh, through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And so I got that grant. And so now I'm back on track, right? I'm back on track. I've got the, I've got the mentored grant. I'm gonna get that R01. It's gonna be straight path. And then Yale. So uh, we'll start with the first part of this. So. Uh, Steve Hebert, after doing two years in the lab at, uh, at, at Vanderbilt, said, hey, Robert, I'm going to Yale. I'm, I'm actually sick of being a clinician. I'm going to go. I'm going to be the chair of physiology at Yale. You can come there. You can do a little bit of attending in nephrology and, and, and do some more work in physiology. And at this point, I said, man, uh, this is a lot of moving, right? A, a six-year fellowship, three places in six years. Not, not too good for productivity. Uh, on the other hand, never hurts to have Harvard and Yale on your resume, right? I mean, that's 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 not something we should we should shirk, right? So, uh, so I actually thought about trying to go out on my own and open my own lab at this point, but something happened with the science that essentially prevented that from happening, and that was uh, as we were making this transition to Yale, uh, I found out that the uh, the uh, thing that I had based my grant on was actually a cloning artifact. I thought I had identified and I was told that I had identified splice variants that were hyperactive or hypoactive. And I was studying them for a couple of years and found out that they were actually did not exist in the actual mouse or human body. And these, these splice variants were cloning artifacts. And so for my first um, grant, uh, I got zero first off in publications, and I thought, this is it. I got no publications from that project at all, and I essentially wasted, uh, in my mind, wasted a, a number of years, and I was now uh, completely off track, and there was no way that I was going to achieve any of those goals at, at, at that point, and I really did think that Perhaps my career was over, and perhaps it was time to maybe go into private practice. So, what happened next? So, so those cloning artifacts um, through that process. Uh, these are actually oocytes, uh, frog eggs that we inject CNRA into, and then we can express various proteins in these in these frog eggs, and. Uh, during this, uh, this investigation of what turned out to be these cloning artifacts, I pioneered a new technique to look at surface expression in this co-transporter with GFT tag co-transporters. That did nothing for this project because again, these were cloning artifacts. But what it did lead to was another paper. And so I took that technique and, and many other techniques that I had learned over the previous years and I applied them to this, this new paper, this new project, which was looking at glycosylation of the co-transporter and, and its relation to surface expression. And so I took that old technique that I had pioneered, I applied it to a new project. I got that first author paper uh, and, uh, in Jason, and maybe I still had a shot. Maybe I could still make it, we'll see. So with that, cloning artifact uh, and, uh, was able to use this this paper and other papers that I published in this time, and I was still had the KOA open. So I, I went and I said, well, you know, I'm not ready for an R01, but what I can do is I can go get a KOA grant. 
uh, and, and do an, another period of kind of mentored research uh, and moved to the University of Chicago, became an assistant professor uh, during this time. Finally, um, finish with Steve Hebert, open my own lab, go to University of Chicago. So, and here I am, young, young Robert Hoover, I think you see me right there in the middle, uh, there at, uh, at University of Chicago amongst our group. So, um, so now we're at, uh, we're at University of Chicago and, and, and these are things that uh, will come up for all of us. So family issues came up at this time. And I was, my mom uh, was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, uh, found to have mets to the brain. Um, at this time, I had recently gotten married before that. Uh, my wife was pregnant with twins. She delivered twins prematurely. Twins were in the neonatal ICU in, in Chicago. Mom was heading towards hospice in um, Washington, D.C. Um, and you can imagine that during this period of time, I was essentially useless, right, in terms of science. I got zero science done for probably about six months. Um, and, uh, and was in a period of mourning, and, uh, and, and that definitely uh, took me off track for a period of time. But what brought me back? What brought me back? These two, my twins. They did well. They came out of neonatal ICU. They came out, they were smiling, they were laughing, they had the, the infectious spirit of my mother, and okay. We, we've gotten over this, we've mourned, we've gotten through this, we're ready to get back on track, we're ready to get back on the pathway. So I get back on the pathway, and now as I kind of come out of this, I realize that there is a big, big problem at the University of Chicago. In fact, there's a problem of institutional racism at the University of Chicago. Uh, and I found out really after I went there, that in their internal medicine residency program, out of 99 house officers, 99 residents in the internal medicine training program, there was one African-American resident out of 99 residents on the south side of Chicago taking care of a almost 100% patient population. Horrendous. Absolutely affecting patient care. Absolutely people falling through the cracks. Absolutely, I will tell you, with this kind of environment, there were people who were dying who were not getting the appropriate care in this kind of environment. And I said, I, I've, I've got to do something about this. This, this is affecting people. This is, uh, this is causing damage. This is a violation of the Hippocratic Oath because we are doing harm to this patient population by doing this. Um, so I went to the chair at the time. I said, hey, you know, this is a big problem. I think I can help you with it. Would you, would you, would you like me to help you with it? How, like, what are you guys doing now to address this? And the chair said, yep, we treat everybody the same. We don't treat anybody different. Everybody comes in. They get the exact same process. They go home. They get the exact same treatment. And so, of course, what was happening was these, these African-American candidates were saying, hey, University of Chicago is great. They're very diverse in their med school. And they're coming there and they're saying, okay, nobody's saying anything about this very obvious problem that they have. I'm not meeting any people of color who are also who are in the residency. I am, uh, I look back on the pictures for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I look back to 10 years and I see no people of color. And then I don't meet. That one resident, they've got her hidden away because she's got a lot of bad things to say. So don't meet her. And then you go home and you say, okay, these guys are, are in denial. They have a massive, massive problem and they don't think that they have a problem. And so you, per you perpetrate it year after year after year. So, yeah, talk to my mentors. Mentors say, hey, you know, forget that. Get into the lab. Make those papers, get those grants. Don't worry about that. One thing I did know that without the support of the chair, there is nothing that was gonna change. So I did that. I went back into my lab, I grinded away, made papers, 
started writing grants, started planning for the R01. Then something happened. We got a new chair. His name was Skip Garcia. He was chief of pulmonary at Hopkins, came from the University of Chicago as chairman of medicine. He was the head of the diversity committee at Hopkins. And so when he came, he said, Robert, what is going on here? This is crazy. You got one out of 99? He said, hey, you know, they, they didn't think it was a priority. He said, all right, we're going to change that. I'm going to make you associate vice chair for diversity. I'm going to make Monica Vela uh, uh, the co-associate vice chair. We're going to make you guys vice chairs for diversity. You're going to change this for us. And I said, well, I don't know. Mentors are saying, stay in the lab, find a way. Don't worry about that. Somebody else will take care of that. I thought about it a while. And I said, this is an opportunity for transformational change, A. And B, this is something I'm very passionate about. Pursue your passion. Pursue your passion. I'm very passionate about scientists, but I'm also very passionate about this. I said, okay, I'll do it. So we transformed the whole process. I won't, in the interest of time, I won't go through how, but we transformed the whole process. And uh, within four years, we had gone from one out of 99 to 12 African-Americans out of 99, which is one of, the, one of the best top five, was one of the top five percentages in the country at the time. I left um, after four years, um, as I'll detail a little later, my, my, um, my co-vice chair, um, Monica Valley State University of Chicago, and in another three years, had 20 African-American residents out of 100, all from fantastic places, places that the University of Chicago had been missing, people from Harvard and people from Yale and people from University of Pittsburgh and people from Wash U and people from all these wonderful institutions that they had been missing out on simply because they had a toxic uh, environment uh, that nobody, that no person of color wanted to go to. So we went from one to 20 in about six years. And what I found out later was that as you're going through the process and you're advancing your career, people like instances where you can say, hey, I made a transformational change. And, and that's what we did there. So University of Chicago, so back to the science. So I'm grinding away. Uh, I, I write a grant on looking at the hormonal regulation of the sodium, uh, sodium chloride co-transporter, the thiazide sensitive sodium chloride co-transporter. Had a postdoc in my lab, Ben Coe. He's now uh, he's now associate professor at University of Chicago, uh, who um, worked in my lab and uh, played an instrumental role in in this project, looking at hormonal regulation of the co-transporter. This just shows one of the studies that we did, which uh, uh, demonstrated that if you give the hormone aldosterone you can increase the sodium chloride co-transporter activity acutely within hours, and that the activity of that co-transporter goes up uh, more with more uh, express protein expression over days. Uh, and so guess what? So this is gone, this is happening, we did all this. And now, yes, there it is, the R01. The R01, you get the R01, and I got the R01 with this, this grant on the, the sodium chloride co-transporter and, and hormonal regulation of the co-transporter. So yes, things are, are back on track. It took a while, a lot of twists and turns, back on track. Uh, and then University of Chicago, University of Chicago, right after I got my fundable score for the R01 kind of imploded. And I won't go through what, what happened there in the interest of time, but uh, suffice it to say, when I got my fundable score at the University of Chicago, I had an interim chief of nephrology, I had an interim chairman of medicine, and I had an interim dean. <laughs> and so there was uh, no support present. And I was like, yeah, you know, yeah, you can stay if you want, but you know, there's, there's not going to be much support uh, until we get this all fixed, which obviously at that point was going to take years. And so, so well, this is a good time to look at other things. And this is when I went back to Emory University at, on faculty. And, and there at Emory University, um, I, I started a project uh, looking at uh, the association of the sodium chloride co-transporter and the epithelial sodium channel. And I found a very interesting thing, and that is that these two proteins that are very, very important for 
uh, the regulation of blood pressure in, in our body were actually bound together, uh, linked together in, the, in, the, in this part of the nephron, the, the second part of the distal convoluted tubule. We'll go through all of this, but, but suffice to say that this, this uh, slide basically shows immunoprecipitation studies showing that these two proteins associate with each other. Um, and uh, we, we looked at it from many different uh, aspects. We looked with co-IPing with an MCC antibody, IPing with the ENAC antibody. Uh, uh, each, each way, we looked in kidney cortex, we looked in uh, uh, cell lines, and any way we did it, these two proteins associated with each other. And uh, this is uh, a uh, immunogold electron microscopy. It was done by my colleague, Franz Franziska Thielig in Germany. Um, and uh, this is Brandy Wynn, who did a lot of the work. She's a postdoc now. She is an assistant professor in her own lab in Utah. She did a lot of work associated with this project. And this is an immunogold electron microscopy. And it's, I find it to be very interesting. Basically, what it's, what's going on is uh, these small particles are basically uh, the, ep the uh, uh, epithelial sodium channel, the gamma subunit of the epithelial subchannel being labeled, and the bigger dots, which is uh, immunogold electron microscopy uh, particle, 12 nanometer particle, and this is a six nanometer particle, the smaller one. And what this shows is that the, the gamma ENAC and the NCC appear to be as close, in fact, closer than what looks to be their respective dimers, um, indicating that uh, they are close enough to be bound together. And so I thought this was really, really cool. Like the two most important sodium transporting proteins in the kidney are bound together, linked together. Uh, some of the reviewers thought, uh, you know, well, what does it mean? You know, does it have any significance? Or is this just some anomalous finding that you found uh, that, that they're bound together? So they wanted to know, is there any uh, significance? And so what we found was that, I thought that the epithelial sodium channel, which is not sensitive, is not inhibited by uh, thiazide diuretics under normal circumstances, that if you co-expressed it with the uh, co-transporter, it actually was sensitive to thiazide diuretics. And so in those cells where NCC and ENAC were together, uh, ENAC became uh, susceptible to inhibition by thiazide diuretics. And so that thiazide diuretics that we were giving the patients uh, was, was having an effect on ENAC as well as having its well-known effect on NCC. And, and this is just uh, electrophysiology experiments done by Oleg Pachuknik, one of my collaborators, showing that if you give a thiazide diuretic, the open probability of the EMAC channel decreases significantly. And you can see here in this tracing, this electrophysiology tracing, there are a lot more, each one of these represents an open channel. There's a lot more open channels here. Uh, and then if you give the thiazide diuretics, there's a lot more closed channels, indicating that the function of the EMAC was uh, decreased. And we then took this to split open tubules in, in actual uh, mice and showed that in, in the living tubule, uh, the same thing happens that uh, if you give a thiazide diuretic, you decrease the open probability, you decrease the function of, of the epithelial sodium channel ENAC. And, uh, and importantly, that in the absence of NCC, thiazides have no effect on ENAC function. Uh, we also went on to show that, and I'll, I'll kind of zoom through these, but we also went on to show that uh, the co-expression or the co-localization of the EMAC and the, and the, and the NCC was uh, much more frequent if we gave animals uh, aldosterone via mini pumps. And so these are just a bunch of other pictures that show the co-transporter and the, the, uh, the epithelial sodium channel very close to each other. And uh, briefly, I'll mention that uh, one of the things that you always have to prove, if you're going to prove that two things are bound together, you got to identify the binding site, mutate that binding site, prevent, and show that you can prevent the binding. And we've begun this process now. Um, we, we've narrowed it down to the last 132 amino acids of, of, uh, of EMAC, that is the binding site for the sodium chloride co-transporter. I won't go through this whole slide, but, uh, but I'll just point out one thing that if you mutate the last uh, bit of the co-transporter, you take it off, you remove the carboxy terminus, you prevent binding, 
And then if you remove the last 130 amino acids, you also pr prevent binding. We've got some more data uh, that, that shows that uh, it actually is the last 40 amino acids of, of the epithelial sodium channel. Well, skip through that. Okay, so, uh, so we went through that, went through that, moved to Emory. And that data that I just showed you uh, led to uh, a VA merit grant, uh, which uh, uh, then led to becoming, uh, getting promoted to associate professor at Emory University. And, uh, and then uh, there was another very interesting project. Uh, this is Contoria Williams, who was a postdoc in my lab as well. And I will say she is my first uh, mentee to get an R01 grant herself. So now either I'm, I'm, I'm now a senior mentor, I'm really old because I now have a mentee who has an R01, uh, but I am very proud of her. And she uh, undertook this project in my lab, which eventually led to her R01. And that is looking at zinc deficiency and its effects on blood pressure and the sodium chloride co-transporter. I'm gonna, so I'm just gonna zoom through this. Uh, zinc deficiency, uh, if you put an animal on a zinc deficient diet, you increase expression of the sodium chloride co-transporter and you also increase blood pressure in a manner that is dependent on the sodium chloride co-transporter. Um, and so uh, you can see that it's, these animals were placed on a zinc deficient diet and uh, the zinc deficient diet uh, animals got hypertensive kind of in a bit biphasic manner uh, but at six weeks, they were uh, uh, frankly hypertensive. Uh, and if you gave them back zinc, they actually went back down to a, a normal blood pressure. And so zinc deficiency increases blood pressure, and it appears to do it through, uh, through uh, in action of the sodium chloride co-transporter. Um, I'm going to skip through that. So I wanna make sure that I leave plenty of time for the unveiling and for questions, for questions on my talk and also for the unveiling. So, uh, so went through this process, R1, associate professor. And then again, something came up that uh, by this time, my, my, my mentor, Steve Eber had passed. And so he wasn't able to tell me to not do this but uh, he would have absolutely told me to not do this. Uh, and that is to become the Associate Program Director at Emory. And so the Associate Fellowship Program Director, uh, what happened at Emory, which happened to many programs was uh, at this time, it's now several years ago, uh, they didn't fill their fellowship program. Um, and it was the first time Emory had not filled their fellowship program ever. Uh, and uh, so uh, they, they said, hey, Robert, you know, you've been at Vanderbilt, you've been at Brigham and Women's, you've been at University of Chicago, you've been at Yale. Uh, can you help us, you know, get, get the program together? And uh, they, they were really doing some things there that were not conducive to a, a modern uh, fellowship program, both in recruitment and structure of the program. Uh, and so Jeff Sands asked me to be on the committee to look at it. I, I said, okay, I'll be on the committee, but I'm not gonna, once we finish our study, I'm not gonna do anything else with it. And, and so then I got on the committee and the next thing you know, I was running the recruiting for the whole fellowship program. And so they said, hey, Robert, you're doing the, all the work on an APD anyway, why don't you just take an APD title? And, and I said, okay, I, I guess I'll do that. Uh, but um, uh, there was no FTE at this point. Now you're actually required to give FTE, but this was like a zero FTE job. And so my, my, uh, my mentor would have absolutely said on this one, don't do that. Go get in your lab, publish your papers, do your science. I did it anyway. I figured if I didn't do it, then we wouldn't have fellows and, and that would be bad for me too. So <laughs> I said, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna become the APD and then my last year at Emory, we had our most successful uh, recruiting year ever. Um, and, and so from not filling to best recruiting year ever, so I was able to tell later on as things happened that, hey, I, I've done this other transformational thing. And so when did that become important? So we're gonna go back through this, all these different steps and all this, this morass of things that, that happened and, uh, and in fact, this played a key role in the next step, which was moving from Emory 
to moving to chief of nephrology at Tulane uh, and becoming full professor with tenure uh, was as I went through that process and they were trying to find out, well, you know, we want leaders for these positions. And I interviewed a couple of few places. And, and, and so they would say, well, what have you done? What administration have you done? And they'd say, well, what kind of transformational thing have you been involved in? And, uh, and, and, and my, my uh, fellowship brain and my um, residency brain thought, you know what, the only thing they really care about is do I have those R01 grants, right? That's what's gonna get me to full professor. That's what's gonna get me uh, to potentially have an opportunity to be chief. And, and in fact, those things were important. Those things were valued. But they wanted to know that I had done some administrative work. They wanted to know that I had done something transformational uh, outside of science. And, and so these things uh, led to uh, uh, these, these, these other things. And so the tangential path uh, is, uh, is a viable path. And just because you get derailed at certain points in time does not mean that you cannot go through the, the path uh, outside of the, the Ben Humphreys path. <laughs> so uh, just a quick review, undergrad brain ha had that whole neurosurgery thing, and then the residency brain thought it was gonna be this straight line, and, uh, and, and then this is actually, you know, how things, things happened uh, with this morass of different changes and uh, a, a very nonlinear uh, pathway through this, this process. Um, so uh, I'm gonna stop there and just give the acknowledgements. I, I've talked about a number of these people, Brandy Wynn and Clintoria Williams, who now have their own labs, are now PIs at different institutions. My, my uh, uh, colleague, Francisca Thalig in uh, Germany and uh, Ben Koh, uh, who did a lot of that in, only for Chucklick. And I, I, I didn't mention, I, I should have mentioned uh, my collaborator, Emery Doug Eaton, who do, did a lot of the electrophysiology work that I showed that was done at, uh, at uh, Emory University. Um, and uh, Doug has been a valuable uh, mentor and collaborator as well. Um, and with that, I will, I will stop there so that I can take questions and leave time for them, Valen. Hoover, thank you so much for that incredibly inspirational talk, really, and for sharing so, so many of your personal stories. And you clearly have made transformational changes, and, and we are all really very fortunate to hear about those today. So we have time for um, a few questions from the audience. Otherwise, so Ben? Robert, I really was inspirational. Go sideways and not just straight up the way we envision. Sometimes it can feel demoralizing and like we're going in reverse. So, how did you have those feelings? And do you have any advice for people who may be on, in, in a sideways part of their career in terms of you know not losing the um, notion that things will work out? And yeah, so absolutely. Well you know, I actually, as I as I'm as I'm thinking about what I talked about today, I actually left out one of the, probably actually one of the biggest challenges in my career. Uh, and that was uh, getting that R01 grant. I kind of said, oh yeah, I got the R01 grant, I grinded one. Well, what I left out was that I put in that R01 grant three times before it was finally <laughs> accepted, right? And so I, I put that R01 in and my KO8 was winding down and I didn't get it. And I put the R01 in and, and I KO8 is you know, really winding down now and I didn't get it. And I was actually at the point where if I didn't get that R01 that next um, cycle, uh, I was been told by my section chief that I was gonna have to start seeing a lot more patients. And then once you go down that pathway, it's hard to get back because you don't have the time to do the science to actually get back on that path. And so I was really kind of at my last shot at the R01. And I was even thinking about, do, do I go into private practice? If I don't get this, what am I going to do? Um, and, and so 
when I got that, that fundable score, it wasn't a magic thing. It was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of uh, uh, effort. And I, I really was kind of at a crossroads where I think I, I certainly would not have been able to go continue down the path I was going down had I not got that, that fundable score. And so I think the lesson there is keep putting those grants in, right? Keep trying, whatever your area is, continue to put it in until they tell you you can't anymore, right? At some point in time, yeah, somebody's gonna say, hey, no, time's up. I, I've given you all the time that I have. But until they tell you that, keep pushing, keep going, keep going, keep putting those grants in until somebody takes it away. I don't know about aqua dermatitis. Um, now, you know, obviously the thing that we that we don't know um, so well, although we know that it is certainly present, and that there is a significant amount of zinc deficiency um, in the U.S. population. How much zinc deficiency is playing a role in the development of hypertension in the U.S. population is really unknown. But uh, you know, obviously the impact, the potential impact of this study and, and these studies is that if you do identify uh, uh, that zinc deficiency is a major determinant of blood pressure, then guess what? We'll start measuring zinc levels in patients and our hypertensive patients and correcting that zinc deficiency. And our studies in mice would indicate that if we did that, we can actually take those patients back to normal blood pressure if zinc deficiency is playing a significant part in their hypertension. Um, I did something here uh, that was kind of a, um, a, uh, a, a paying it forward kind of thing with this particular idea. Um, when I was uh, putting in my, my R01, uh, I didn't have any senior author papers. And I had a paper with my mentor that was, I was getting ready to submit I was supposed to be first author. He was supposed to be senior author. I went to my mentor, my mentor in National Academy of Sciences, and you know, a bunch of nature papers and a bunch of PNAS papers. And this was a PNAS paper. And I said, Steve, uh, I really need to be senior author on this paper. I started in your lab, but really the bulk of this paper was done in my own lab when I moved. And I really need to be the senior author on this paper. I'm not going to get this all. Uh, and I need you to move, not to first author, I need you to move to the middle of the paper, because I got a postdoc who actually has done a lot of the work here. He needs to be senior author. Can, can you do that? And Steve said, sure, Robert, <laughs> go ahead. For him, a PNAS paper had no meaning at that point. He had so many PNAS papers, he didn't know what to do with it. And I said, but for me, it meant everything. And, and so I thought about this when I came to the point with my mentee, Clintoria Williams, and I said, Wow, we, we, we got this whole project. Now, mind you, the idea of looking at this was her idea, but the money that actually made it happen was the, my lab's money, right? And so the first couple of years, three years of that project uh, were all her idea, but were all my money. And then we both knew it was a fantastic idea for a new grant. And I said, you know what, Clintoria, take that project, go to Wright State, write up your R01 with that project and, and you get your R01 and I'll be fine. I have some other projects I'll work on and, and sure enough, it resulted in R01, but pay it forward. You know, my, my mentor made that for him, which was a small sacrifice. And so later on, I realized that, you know, that's what you have to do. You, you make some sacrifices for your mentees, so. Victor Hoover, that was really incredible. Um advice for all of us and, and you are a remarkable role model sponsor and transformational leader so thank you very much Thanks. So, so now i get to talk a little bit about dr will ross who's here um, it's, it's a real honor to be able to um tell you about why we decided to create a portrait of Dr. Will Ross so that he could hang on the wall here in this academic medical center 
and and um, and be visible to all um, forever. Um, so so will you know, um, did his undergraduate training at, at Yale and then came here to Wash U for medical school, did his residency in internal medicine at Vanderbilt, and then came back to Wash U to do a nephrology fellowship. So we were incredibly fortunate to have him here for, for two key episodes of his uh, formative medical training. And shortly after Will finished his fellowship, he was recruited by Dean Peck, to direct the Office of Diversity Programs, and, and he became a nephrology faculty member here. And um, as the director of the initial Office of Diversity Programs here, he made an incredible transformational difference, uh, as you did, Dr. Hoover, by really um, dedicating a huge amount of time and effort to recruiting medical students, to supporting medical students, and to mentoring medical students. And he and his wife and, and both of their, their kids actually opened their homes um, to really show support and dedication to all of our underrepresented trainees here. And that included, um, I think, in, in a very important ways, really providing levels of support through their recruitment, through their time in medical school, problem solving, supporting all of the things that, that they had going on in their lives so that they could be successful and continuing to support them through their residencies and fellowships and, and as alumni. So I think if you ask the vast majority of diverse medical students who have graduated from here in the past 25 years, they would say the most important figure in their time here at Washington University was Dr. Will Ross. And then Will got an MPH and, and uh, really um, extended his work and effort to the community and to building programs to advance social justice and health equity. And he did that by establishing the Saturday Neighborhood Health Clinic, by building programs to advance diversity and pipeline programs for pharmacy students, for health profession students, and for mentoring and sponsorship for high school kids, undergraduates, so that they could see um, that they had the potential and could be successful in medical careers, nursing careers, pharmacy careers. Um, and he, he paid it forward. He also developed the WashU Medical Plunge, which was and, and still is an incredible program to teach medical students and, and our residents and fellows about the health disparities in St. Louis and the Del Mar divide and the incredible health inequity that is associated with um, uh, structural racism uh, and, and poverty that propagates inequities. And, and he worked with the community and was visible and engaged to make a difference in every stage, um, both in St. Louis, but also through his work in the AAMC and the CDC and the Institute of Medicine and his international efforts. Um, he is indefatigable. You know, he, he is the most energetic person and, and resilient person I know because he's been working on diversity um, as, as a single player in the beginning, before any of us were listening, before any of us understood. And Will was patient and kind and compassionate and never got angry and never got frustrated. Not that I saw anyway, maybe, maybe uh, at home, you know, banging on the wall. <laughs> But, but he was always trying to push it forward and make us do better and, and open our eyes. And, and Will, I'm incredibly grateful because I, I think you've done an amazing job. On top of all of that, you're also a distinguished clinician. And, and I have had the fortunate um, time of seeing patients with you. We overlapped in training, so, so we often saw patients together. And Will is a distinguished clinician who's won a number of honors and awards uh, for his clinical activities, AOA, and lots of teaching awards. And I think his patients love him, both in the clinic and in the inpatient service. 
And he has taught us all how to really care for patients from diverse backgrounds and how to treat everyone with respect that they deserve and to make sure that we take care of each and every patient as if they were a member of our own family. And on, you know, in addition, uh, Will has been a wonderful husband to uh, Arlene and um, a wonderful father to his two daughters, um, who I think are, are on the, the Zoom now. And, and so I think Will is living proof that you can do it all, um, uh, but it takes a long time. It's a marathon. You can't give up. You got to be incredibly resilient and, and patient. And, and I'm sure you felt like you were wearing a flak jacket um, for the past 25 years but I am incredibly grateful to everything that you've done for the nephrology division, the Department of Medicine, Washington University School of Medicine, St. Louis, um, and the country. So, so please come up here and Ben, please come up because... Um, take a bunch of pictures. Dr. Hooper, we'd love to have you in the pictures and Ben and Eduardo, if you can get you to come down and take pictures, that would be good for you. Thanks, 